so long. Please do, and I really want to watch. <laughs> oh, what I do is I, I use communion to make my move. Your microphone is on. Hello? Well, good morning. Welcome to worship today. I think based on comments, most of us are glad to see a little rain, so I don't know what, why this side is the winner over this side. You guys are, you guys are important too, don't... Uh, uh, today is rally day and uh, lots of stuff coming in, lots of baked items and things and we have some quiche getting ready maybe you saw the tables outside on the on the cement so you won't have to walk on the wet grass but hopefully you can stay after worship today for a little brunch together and again we'll be outside so hopefully we'll be comfortable with that um, Sunday school starts next week and Sandy will have the kids and there's a schedule for adult studies on the inside of your announcements so I invite you to check that out. Um, after the brunch, we're assembling refugee kits, and I've seen lots of diapers and things come in that will assemble for refugee families that, that are needing, needing some items. Then as far as worship today goes, I invite you to consider um, when we get to the the sermon in the gospel reading, there's maybe 
can think of bookends where there's Jesus heals a blind man before our reading and then at the end of this section that we're starting today heals another blind man. So in chapter 8 there's a blind healing so the uh, man is able to see and then at the end of chapter 10 uh, he heals another blind man and then in chapter 11 is Jesus triumphal entry. So what does it mean to be able to see? And then after the sermon, we'll be singing, Open the Eyes of My Heart. So some things to think about, our ability to see and, and what, we, what we see. I think that will be what I want to share for today. So we have a call to worship, or excuse me, a prelude in Christ alone. And the words will be on the screen, so feel free if you want to sing along. as we begin our worship today with our confession and hearing the announcement, the proclamation of God's forgiveness of all our sins. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose word is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Please be seated. prayer of the day. O God, through suffering and rejection, you bring forth our salvation, and by the glory of the cross, you transform our lives. Grant that for the sake of the gospel, we may turn from the lure of evil, take up our cross, and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 9. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The second lesson is from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Taming the tongue. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Word of God, word of life.
today is in the middle section of Mark and Jesus begins to tell us what it means that he is our living hope. So chapter 8 beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the village villages around Caesarea Philippi and on the way Jesus asked his disciples who do people say I am? They replied some say John the Baptist others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Kids can come forward. Well, good morning. How are you guys today? Good. So I have a question. 
Do you guys think that our words matter? Yeah? Do you remember specifically a time that somebody might have been mean to you? And do you remember what those words were? Yeah? And do you remember a time when somebody was nice or complimented you? And do you remember what those words were? Yeah? Well, I do too. I was looking at some old yearbooks and was remembering some of the mean things that people used to say to me and some of the really nice things that people used to say to me. And as I was thinking about how important our words are, I was looking at the readings for today. And in our reading from James today, the second reading, it said that we can't tame our tongue, that our tongue can do both things. It can be mean, but it can also be nice. But there was also that weird part about like fresh and salt water and like that which produces salt water can't produce fresh water. I was wondering what that meant. And I kept thinking about, do you guys ever, not that any of you have ever been mean, but when you're mean to somebody, it's a lot easier to keep being mean to them, isn't it? Yeah? It's a lot harder once you've been mean to somebody to try and turn around and be nice to them, isn't it? And I think that's what James meant. And maybe that's why in our gospel today, when Peter had the right words, and he said, Jesus, you're the Messiah. And then he turned around and tried to tell Jesus, no, 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 you're not going to die. And then Jesus was like, hey, that's not, that's, that's not how this goes. Right, those aren't the right words. Right? So our words kind of, they do matter, don't they? So I have another question. But first, have you guys ever heard of Kid President? You guys know who he is? Yeah? It's a YouTube series from a few years ago. I don't know if any of you out there have heard of him. About eight years ago, he was just a little bit older than some of you guys. And he made all these YouTube videos and was talking to teachers and moms and dads and giving them a bunch of pep talks. But he did one video and it was 20 things we should say more often. But since our words matter, what are some things you think this week we could say to show that we're saying the right the good words, the nice words. What are some words that we can say? Some things that we can say. You're nice. Please and thank you. I have to say yes and bye. Any other ones? You look nice today. You look nice today. I like that. Well, those are all really good. But another one that I don't think we hear enough in our world is, you are loved. Did you guys all know that you are loved? Yeah? Well, I think you guys are lucky, and not a lot of people hear that. So I'm going to challenge and encourage you this week to tell one person that they are loved. Can you, you think you guys can do that? Yeah? Cool. Well, before you guys head back, will you guys pray with me? We're going to do a repeat after me prayer. Okay, so let's pray. Dear God, repeat after me, guys. Dear God, thank you for the gift of language. Help us to use our words to spread love in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So several of us were reading through the Bible this past year and we finished last Sunday on the 5th of September and uh, talking with Mark later in the week he said he woke up the next morning and he said now what? And I remember feeling the same thing because my routine was to do the daily reading in the morning before the, the day really got going. And I remember that same feeling, now what? Because all of a sudden there was this void. 
And so Mark had a good idea. He said, I'm going to read through the New Testament uh, now until the end of the year. We want, to start, we want to read through the Bible again starting January 1st. So how do we fill this gap? And that was an excellent idea to read, read the New Testament. So I thought, well, maybe I can do the same thing. Um, we're in the year of Mark, so I, he started with Matthew at the very beginning. I started with the Gospel of Mark, since that's our readings anyway right now. And so I'll finish up December 24th on um, Christmas Eve. So um, a good way to stay reading the Bible and, and continue that, that um, good habit that we started over the past year. And there's a good reason for wanting to do that. Because we believe that the Bible is God's story of salvation, and so of course we want to be reading that story of salvation. And it's not salvation just for us, but it's for all of creation. And so we, we want to come to learn what that means, and what it means to be people of God who live in that new reality of, of God's salvation for creation. So it's essential to know this story, and also to know how we fit in that story. And I think that's maybe what the prophet Isaiah was talking about in the first reading this morning from, from Isaiah, where he says, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed, to know the word that sustains the weary. So like I said, I'm starting with Mark and the Bible project that was our guide reading through the Bible, they made these great videos that gave us an overview for the book of the Bible. So I watched the one on Mark again, and they split Mark's gospel into three sections. In the first section, they said, up into chapter eight, tells us who Jesus is. And so Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, for example, by John the Baptist, and then a voice from the cloud says, this is my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And then Jesus casts out somebody who's demon-possessed. And as he comes up to the person possessed by the demon, the demon shouts out, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so through these, these ways, Mark is telling us who Jesus is. And then Jesus goes about forgiving sins and healing the sick, including, like I said at, at the beginning, that he heals t at least two people who are blind. So in this first section, Mark is telling us who Jesus is. And now today we start the second, the middle section of Mark's gospel. And Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? And as we heard, Peter responds, you are the Messiah. And Messiah or Christ that we're more familiar with literally means the anointed one. And so the prophet Samuel would anoint Saul to be king over Israel. And then after he proved he wasn't really up to the task, then he anoints David to be king in his place. That is king in a, a sense of military and of nationhood and of, of politics. And Jesus is, we find out in Mark, not that kind of Messiah, not that kind of anointed one. He's not what we expect a king to be and to do. And so in this middle section, which we just started today, Jesus will tell us three times about his coming death and, and resurrection. So consider the structure of this, this middle section. I, like I said at the beginning, maybe we could scoot two bookends where Jesus, right before our reading today, he heals a man who is blind. And then at the end of this section in chapter 10, he heals another man who is blind. And now they are able to see and then in between those two healings, Jesus tells us these three times about his arrest, his death, and his resurrection. So the read, these, these three foretellings will be today's reading, next week again, and then the third one will come in the middle of October on the 17th. And then after this section, after these two bookends of, of healing of someone who is blind, comes Jesus' triumphal entry, his arrest and, and death on the cross, and then the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross says, surely this man was the son of God. And so it seems obvious that Mark is, is telling us about Jesus the Messiah. 
And like these two men who were blind but now can see, Jesus wants us to truly see what that means, that Jesus is the Messiah. And then what it means to follow him. As Jesus says, anybody who wants to be my follower, anyone who wants to follow after me, must take up their cross and follow me. So what does this mean, that Jesus is the Messiah, and what does it mean to follow him? Today's reading comes in a time of transition and of change. The kids are all back in school now, I think, aren't they, most of us? Teachers as well. Along with that, and of course today is rally day and, and Sunday school starts as well, along with this, this new season of, of schooling comes concern and anxiety about rising COVID cases. You look every day if you get the health report from Pierce County and, and new cases every day were over 400 these days. Together with that, of course, the yes was, yesterday was the anniversary of 9-11 and the horrors that happened on that day. You probably remember where you were on 9-11. We don't even need to say the year. We all know what that means. I was still at seminary in Minnesota and, and I remember going to the bank when they first opened and I thought it was kind of strange. There was a TV on a cart there, and, and I went up to the teller window, and she didn't really say anything. We did our transaction, and, but everybody seemed kind of weird and kind of strange. I uh, then went to the library and, and studied chapel, I'm afraid. I did that a little too often. Um, and so then I got to my first class, and I had heard nothing about what happened that morning. Um, totally clueless, but everybody was just in a state of shock. And maybe you remember for days afterward, the skies were, in, were eerily silent as there were no planes flying. And what we discovered that day is that our world was not what we thought it was, and our relationship to other countries had suddenly changed. We were no longer feeling secure and safe, or I might add, invincible. So today, remembering this history and wondering about our future, especially with the regime change in Afghanistan, with these terrorists on trial in France, not to mention countries that we see as aggressive, like China and Russia and others, we might today as well have feelings of anxiety and fear. The world is continually changing. There is, the future is uncertain and there sure seems to be plenty out there that would harm us. And so we can be tempted to be anxious and, and afraid, or we can look to the future with hope. The message in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is in fact the Messiah, just not the way we expect. And our hope is found in the unexpected surprise of what it means that Jesus is this Messiah, and also what it means to follow him to know the word that sustains the weary and to gain a well-instructed tongue that is able to speak that word, to speak that word in a weary world. And we are weary, aren't we? We're weary of this pandemic, of political and cultural division, of harsh words and hatred, of weary, we're weary of being anxious and afraid. There is so much anxiety in the world and as we look around, there are good reasons but we know the word of hope. So it's good to immerse ourselves and others in this hope that we have in Jesus. Not to put our head in the sand, as somebody said, and to pretend that these problems and these sufferings don't exist, but instead to stand in the face of all of these and to say, we have a better word. We know a better word that gives us hope. So think about the differences. Think of if, if we go about only watching the evening news or reading the newspaper or whatever your news feed is on your phone, if that is all that, if that's the only word that you hear continually day after day, then of course you will be afraid, you will be anxious. In the Wall Street Journal, they had a, had a whole section devoted to 9-11 um, and the history and aftermath and where people are today that were that were there back then, and one parent talked about how on 9-11 they had a four-day-old child, and they wondered what kind of world 
have I brought this baby into? On the other hand, reading your Bible, studying and, and being in conversation with others about what you find there, coming to weekly worship and hearing the word of God, these are ways that we hear a different word, a word of hope, the hope that we have in Jesus. And so we need to immerse ourselves in these words of hope that we find in scripture in order to be able to stand against other words that produce fear. You've heard the saying, garbage in, garbage out. It's probably the same fear in, then fear out. On the other hand, I think it's also true, hope in and hope out. As we dwell on words of hope, then we become people of hope and we come to know the hope that sustains the weary. And this word is not our own, it's not something that we have to find and discover and, and come up with ourselves. Whatever it means to deny ourselves and to take up the cross and follow Jesus, it means following him, doing just that. And instead of choosing or plotting our next steps, we, we merely allow Jesus to lead us. And we hope and we trust that where he is leading us and as we follow him, we are on the way to eternal life. And so this is why we read and, and study our Bibles and why we come to worship, because here we find the words to sustain us in our weary world. And that word is Jesus himself, our Messiah, the Christ. Maybe you heard Martin Luther said about the Bible, that the Bible is the cradle for Christ. That is, in its pages, it holds Christ. The words we find in scripture proclaim Jesus Christ. And so our prayer, our prayer is that we have ears able to hear, we have eyes able to see, and we gain a well-instructed tongue, able to speak the word that sustains all who are weary. Amen. Please stand as we sing together, open the eyes of my heart. Oh, 
we continue with our prayers. Grounded in our faith in Jesus and serving our neighbor in love, we offer our prayers for the church, for the world, and for all of creation. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for the church throughout the world that it is a safe haven for all who seek refuge. Help your church in the world not to seek and exploit power, instead to be willing to follow Jesus' way that gives life to the world. Help us to set aside differences in our own strong feelings of right and wrong and learn to live Jesus' way of other-centered love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, on another anniversary of 9-11, we remember those who have died and their families left behind. We also watch and observe what is unfolding in Afghanistan. and We continue to be concerned for earthquake victims in Haiti and hurricane and flood victims in New Orleans and the Northeast U.S. And so we continue to pray for all who cry out to you in their suffering. We pray for healing and comfort. We pray that you would fill our hearts with compassion and concern for the well-being of others, especially those with, with power that they would not have concern for the weak and vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we continue to pray as COVID cases continue to rise. Restore those who are sick, keep others from getting sick. We pray especially for Rick and Sarah and Adam and Brandon and give thanks for the healing that Rick has experienced and pray that continues. We give thanks for the healing that Tara Lynn and Winnie have also been able to enjoy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God of transformation, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. We pray you would break the chains of discrimination and injustice, strengthen voices that go unheard, and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And God of life, you draw near to those who cry out for help. So we pray that you would comfort all who mourn, reassure those who are despairing, and heal those who are sick. We pray for Gary and for Julie, for Doug, for Jeff and Grandma Dot. And now you are invited to offer additional petitions either out loud or silently in your hearts. For the family of Ken, friend of Dave's. Kathy Ditsworth, Penny and Frank. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, on this rally day, <clears throat> as we mark the beginning of a new year of Christian education, we pray your blessing on all who teach and all who learn and those who study and discuss. Meet us in the words of the Bible and in our conversations together. May our hearts be transformed and our minds enlightened so that we better are able to follow you and, and to know your word that sustains the weary. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, these prayers we lift to you, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, be with you always. You're invited as we turn our attention to this meal, this bread and wine, this life in Jesus' name. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. Fulfilling the promise of the resurrection, you pour out the fire of your spirit, uniting in one body every nation and every tongue, and so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
We pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, you are invited to come to this table to taste and see that the Lord is good. So please come. You may be seated.
of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now, people of God, you are sent out to bring the word of hope to a suffering and weary world. The Holy Trinity, one God, go with you and bless you now and forever. Amen. All right, we're going to sing our uh, song one more time with the Spanish words third time through. So we'll do a little instrumental, and we'll get the Spanish uh, verse going. Hope Jessica made it today. I think she's helping. Oh, yay. Okay, please, no judgment on the Spanish word. We're doing our... (laughs) Here we go.
Well, I don't know about you, but I did not do so well in the Spanish. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. It is good to worship together. And please stay if you can, if you're comfortable, for some brunch. And, and we'll celebrate the beginning of, of the Sunday school year. Go in God's peace. Thank you.